For things going to trial, we're not going to know that for a long time. Uh, tri right now, trials are so behind that if you're getting a trial date, it's more than a year away right now. Uh, what people have succeeded on is there have been a few uh, temporary restraining orders that have been issued. Um, oh, which one was it? Th there were several of them that were. Uh, is a lot of times judges are dismissing these complaints for failures to state a claim. Uh, and a lot of times the lawyers that are bringing these aren't experienced in constitutional issues. Uh, they, they tend to be brought by employment lawyers because employment lawyers tend to be the ones people first call for that sort of thing and they're the ones that tend to know more about it. Um, I'm not saying that we're going to win on this in the long run. It's worth a try. Uh, and I've got some clients right now who have very, very strong cases, in my opinion. Uh, like I mentioned in, in what I was saying, a lot of the struggle is finding somebody who is an ideal representative of the rights being taken away. You want somebody who's very, very sympathetic. Uh, you know, somebody where, where even the most callous left-wing judge can look at it and they can say, yeah, that person shouldn't be forced to get a vaccination. Uh, so, so part of what we're doing is we're looking for that person. Uh, we haven't partnered with anybody that has that specific focus yet, but we're definitely open to it. Yeah. So, so t t uh, TROs, temporary restraining orders, are heard on shortened notice. Uh, they're basically an emergency measure that puts an immediate freeze on whatever the conduct complained of was for a period of 14 days until the court can hear what's called a preliminary injunction. Uh, and then if the preliminary injunction is granted, that applies for the duration of the case. So we, what we're trying to do is we can at least put a halt to these orders, that, these uh, vaccination orders. You know, by the time the case is actually heard, it might be moot anyway. Unquestionably. Yes, unquestionably. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> yeah my, my office hears that argument a lot too. Uh, I, that's, that's not a waiver of liability for anyone saying it. Okay. Uh, they're still responsible for the actions they take. If it's an illegal directive that was requiring them to do something, they're responsible for their actions under it. Now, we could also take action against Governor Newsom, but that, doesn't, that does not insulate uh, the school district from legal action. Yeah, that's, I, I've, I've encountered, not to that uh, egregious degree, but I've encountered very similar issues in many of the cases I've handled. They're, they're often just pointing to somebody else and saying that there's a schedule they follow to determine whether or not a, a medical uh, exemption request meets a threshold. That, that's not a lawful way of determining. So uh, did they violate on my son's hip Well, I, I can't give personalized legal advice in this context, <laughs> but I can say in a, in a situation like one that you've described, uh, I, I, I don't know about HIPAA rights. I don't think it would be a violation of HIPAA, but it's certainly a violation of rights under California's Health Care Privacy Act, uh, and, and I believe constitutional rights, if, if you refuse to grant a medical exemption to somebody who has demonstrated cause for that. So what are you doing next? I call my office. <laughs> 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 or, or a different attorney, you know. We're not, we're not competitive with the other constitutional lawyers, so. You know, all, all of the above. I, I think that the best way to block these mandates is to make them very difficult to enforce. Uh, and I think the easy, you know, do, do exactly what uh, Edmund Burke was talking about the American colonists doing. You know, the governor, literally, the governor of Massachusetts wrote back to Britain and said, they're giving me so much trouble, what do I do about this? Uh, that's what we do. Uh, and I think the best way of doing that is to file legal action because they have to respond to that. They have no choice. Uh, does that mean we shouldn't do things like the uh, school board meetings? Absolutely not. That's also very, very important. Uh, so it's, you know, be a thorn in their side. Yeah, well, California law actually does not allow compelled medical treatment. Uh, and in fact, they're not allowed to require you to disclose whether or not you've been treated medically. The, tr the problem is that what California law says is that if somebody does not disclose whether or not they've been treated, uh, then the employer can take appropriate action given that absence of information. And employers are currently taking the position that that means that they can fire you as an appropriate action. I don't think that's correct. Uh, that's, that's currently a disputed legal point. Uh, 
Yeah, they're, they're, they're taking the... You're, you're making my case for me, but that's... <laughs> you're welcome, and I'm under right or right now. No, their argument... I don't think it's correct, but their, their argument is essentially that they are not threatening you. They are trying to ensure the safety of their workplace, so they're taking appropriate action, given that they do not know your current medical status. So essentially what they're doing is they're, is they're presuming, before any evidence is presented, before anything is known of any kind, they're presuming that you are a threat and that you may cause harm to your workplace. I, I think that's where, um, I don't think that's an authorized presumption for them to make. Uh, and I think that's the issue with their argument. Uh, so if, if all you want is a letter, a uh, cease and desist letter to your employer, uh, depending on the circumstances, we usually charge between $150 and $200 for that. And, and the instance you bring up is actually an interesting one, Jenna. If your employer just tries to blame government mandates for what they're doing, that does not make them less liable for what they're doing. It actually makes them more liable for what they're doing because it subjects them to something called state actor doctrine, which means that if they're acting under the substantial direction of the state, they are now subject to protections in the Bill of Rights that only apply as against the state. Things like uh, free freedom of speech, uh, right against self-incrimination, 14th Amendment protections like equal protection. So that's, you know, they can make that argument. That does not get them off the hook. It actually gets them in a worse position. Yeah, well, school board is actually already a state actor, so you don't even have to make that argument. Yeah, they're already subject to all that. Okay, yeah. So would that be the good strategy to present? Yes, yeah, it would be. Like, I know there's a lot of parents in the room, right? So we're... I mean, I can't, again, I can't give legal advice, so right. I don't know your particular situation, right. but in general, yeah, I think it is a good idea. Like, can we have class action against the school board? Class actions are a possibility. Um, I, I personally, I think, given the climate right now, I think it's not likely that a California judge is going to certify a class uh, because they have a lot of discretion on that. They have a lot more discretion on whether or not they will certify a class than they do on whether or not they'll take a case in the first place. So I think these cases are more likely to get in front of a judge uh, if we're doing them individually. But class actions are definitely an option. They don't. And if you could prove that your harm was traceable to the vaccine, you would have harm, you would have a lawsuit for damages against them. Problem is you don't have that lawsuit until you can prove that. And because all of the different vaccine companies are denying that what people are experiencing as side effects are in fact side effects, you'll have trouble making that case. But you know, assuming you could prove that, yeah, you actually absolutely could sue them for liability. My, my law firm wouldn't take that case. That's a product's liability case. But. Yes, yeah, if you want us to bring a lawsuit, particularly if there are employment law overlap issues, uh, my firm partners with another attorney who specializes in employment law. Uh, so rates do tend to get more expensive with that. Uh, we've, uh, several of the cases we've taken, I've, or that I've considered and several I've taken, we've quoted retainers of $3,000 for that plus a percentage of recovery. Uh, that's absolutely as low as we can keep it. We're not trying to make a buck off this. Uh, and probably will end up losing money, especially if we don't recover. Uh, but that's, we're, we're trying to do what we can to protect everybody's rights here. Yeah, I, I, not knowing her situation, not knowing all the details of how she's employed and where she works and that sort of thing, uh, I, I can't give legal advice, but I would say she should definitely call an attorney. Sooner rather than later. No, that's, <laughs> uh, well, can they, if they've granted the exemption, can they take it away? Is that so the question? For example, um, uh, my best friend has a religious exemption at Kaiser. Okay. And now they are making her answer all of these questionnaires, and she feels like she, that they're trying to trap her. Like, okay. what exactly, yeah, what they, part of your religion is this violating? They, they, are, they are legally prohibited from trying to argue with somebody who has claimed a religious exemption or trying to convince someone that has a religious objection to change their, change their mind on their religion. That's totally prohibited. It's a violation of your First Amendment rights. Is that a case you would take possibly? Yes. I'll have a point. Yeah. Uh, a lot of that, I, I worked on uh, that case on behalf of the president. Um, and a lot of that's confidential, so I can't really get into the details of what went on there. 
Uh, but essentially what the court ended up saying, and you can tell me whether or not you think this is a good argument, uh, is that the state of Texas has no interest whatsoever in who the president of the United States is going to be. <laughs> I, I don't, I, you know, I'll keep my opinion of that private. <laughs> Oh, sure, yeah. So, so standing basically means that you are in a position where you can sue over something. Uh, it, it's, and, and what that really consists of is whether or not there has been harm against you caused as a result of whatever conduct you're complaining about. Uh, in Texas's case, they said that the fact that there were irregularities in uh, Pennsylvania, Georgia, Wisconsin, and Michigan uh, in, in their elections I might have had one other, no, it was those. Uh, in their elections, essentially meant that Texas was being deprived of a fairly elected president. And they said that that constituted harm against Texas. And that was their grounds for standing there. Um, court didn't agree. Well, if the mandate's unconstitutional, it can't become a law. They can call it a law, they can give it a number, they can put it in the code, it can't become a law. And that's the basis of a constitutional challenge to that, is you're saying that law is not a real law. Um, now, if it's something that was issued as a mandate that theoretically could be a law, um, then yeah, that, that would be a law. And then if you, if you got some kind of uh, exception on the basis of it being a, a mandate, um, then you would lose that. I, I can't think of an instance where that would be true. They, they do have discretion to approve or reject religious exemptions within very limited parameters. And from what I've seen, many, many employers and schools are exceeding their authority on that. Uh, they, they have authority to determine whether or not the religious objection appears to be sincere. And that, that's the basis on which they're proliferating all these things about like, you know, do you really believe this? Which is above and beyond what they need to verify that. It's just, if there isn't appear an appearance of insincerity, there's to presume that it's sincere. Uh, and they can also challenge whether or not the objection is religious in nature. So if you say something like, uh, I don't want to get the vaccine because I think that it could give me a heart attack, and my religion says that I'm not supposed to do things that endanger my life, they could validly challenge that and not grant the exemption uh, because that's not something that's religious in nature. Most people are opposed to harm to themselves. Uh, so that's not really a religious thing. The fetal cell part of it. That, that would be, so if, yeah, if you object on moral grounds to the fetal cells, yeah. that would be a valid religious objection. Now, I, I'm not, I can't write somebody else's religious beliefs for them. I, I do ask that the religious belief portion of our letter be in your own wording. I can review it and tell you whether or not it's likely to be granted, um, but for, for ethical reasons, if you write one that I don't think is likely to be granted, I'm not going to let you rewrite it. Uh, because I, I don't, I'm really not interested in taking cases from people who don't have sincere religious objections to this. If you're just trying to get out of the vaccine and you have some other kind of objection to it and you want to claim a religious one, don't call my office, call somebody else. Yeah, that's a... Uh, it's, well, particularly, you know, that, that's not so much a legal question as, as, a, as a practical question. I don't know that I've got a great answer to that one. Um, yeah, it's, if, um, if we think that they're suppressing information about the effects of this vaccine, then we need to get at whoever's suppressing that information, and we need to have clearly articulable and concrete evidence of the suppression. And then we could come against them for suppressing that information and then possibly make that public. Uh, but as far as, you know, sort of a broad-based approach, I think that's really more of a political question. Yeah, but their argument has a lot of state regulators. Their argument has a lot of state regulators saying they agree with it. And, and, and they have the, the literature from, you know, Pfizer and Moderna agreeing with it. So, so we would need to have some concrete evidence of hiding information if we want to. So the fact that they... I think we're running out of time. Oh, one last question. Sorry. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> A law that any, you know, not, I don't want to again give legal advice to the particular case, but any law that takes away your rights to uh, your free exercise of your religion 
is an illegal law that is protected under the First Amendment of the Constitution. Uh, the only reason a law like that would still be on the books is likely that that law has never been enforced. Because until that law is enforced, nobody can sue over it. So they, they may have plans down, down the road to enforce laws of that nature. If they were to do that, that's when we would bring suit against them. Thank you. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Thank you.